Okay, I guess some of you know Pablo Ivia Yeah. Yeah. You said he was a great teacher, and I really agree with that. Now he is finished with his PhD, and he did some work within wind and economics and preferences. That's what I will say a little bit about here. So we were thinking about, okay, we have all these wind costs and we have like levelized cost curves for wind energy. If you want to compare, well, you could compare onshore wind with offshore wind. Normally you'd say, okay, if you take basic costs, onshore wind is much cheaper, but then you come up with all the restrictions. You have a lot of people who have preferences against turbines near them, some doesn't, but others, they have very strong preferences. How can we incorporate that? We need to take account of that because it's real. So we wanted to address that. And we did that comparing two different methods. So we looked at direct compensation payments and we looked at the Danish case. So how much are people being compensated for turbines built near their own properties? We combine that with all the other domestic schemes we have in Denmark, and then we could add these costs to the basic costs. You would think that, well, are they related to the basic cost? When you have different wind sites in Denmark, some are much better than others, of course, that means that you have a levelized cost curve that's increasing. But what about these intangible costs, these preference costs? We call them acceptance costs, and we add them to the basic cost. And they, for some, some sites, they really dominate. That means some sites are extremely expensive if you include the intangible cost. But it's also a bit uncertain area, because how can you address these intangible the methods we are comparing, some of them are quite direct. That's okay, now we address the actual properties being affected in Denmark. And then we assign values to the properties. Some of them you would have to buy. Others you would have to compensate based on the regulation <coughs> we have. And we took method B. That was looking at all the properties and taking like an estimated value for the value loss of the properties on average. So that was based on experience. How much do you lose if you take a property and put it up near a turbine or rather a turbine near a property? You would lose quite a bit. But on average, it was around 10%. Finally, well, people, they don't all like have preferences only if they are being exposed directly to the turbine. They also have preferences if you're living in a different area where there are maybe not too many turbines, but they don't want turbines. They are, they are afraid that they would see turbines when they go around. And we could try to include that cost as well, but it's, it's one of the most uncertain ones, of course. And that is what you get if you do straight stated preference studies uh, where you ask people about different options and you uh, indirectly calculate their willingness to pay to avoid that uh, location. So this is just taking the first method. When you're looking at well, what is dominating here? So that's the variation in purchase of properties. So if we were sorting 12 gigawatt of potential capacity in Denmark, according to the basic costs, it would look like the blue one. So that's, well, a gradually increase in cost level for more and more sites being developed. If you take the green one, that totally dominates. That means for some of the cheap sites, you would need
need to buy properties. Or some of the more expensive, you would also need to buy properties. But it means that if you were sorting according to these more intangible costs, you would get a totally different uh, ranking of sites. This looks like it's going to be very expensive, but it is, it is not really, because a lot of the sites in between are not with as high cost for buying properties. And we also have a compensation scheme payment here. They are the, the payment you are entitled to if you are in the return line. Now this was method B, it looks now I put it ranked according to the total levelized cost, including acceptance cost. And here you see that, well, you have a gradual increase in these total costs, where the basic cost, the gray ones, that's the small part on the bottom. But it still shows you that you could have quite large amounts of wind in Denmark, and either what, onshore, with relatively low addition of these interchangeable costs. But at some point, you reach like a uh, limit where you have filled out the total space. You need to get very close to a lot of buildings, and that's really costly. If we compare it to three methods, you also have one basic, like more subjective difference. You could say that the three curves we constructed at the bottom here, that's method A, B, and C, will give you a little bit of variation in the local acceptance cost. That's how much people value uh, not being exposed to turbines near them. If you go to this upper level, that's including the willingness to pay from the entire population of them. So everybody, also those not being directly exposed to the turbines. If you think about this, well, these are onshore costs. What are we comparing against? We're, of course, comparing against offshore costs. And you know that's also a bit uncertain and has improved a lot. So if you have six, eight cents in, in offshore costs, it means that even if you include acceptance costs by these three measures, three methods, you would still have lower onshore costs up to quite large quantity in Denmark. But the ones you are preferring are not the same as if you were just sorting according to basic cost. You get an oversorting of the size. So this will give you an idea about, is it possible really to include these exceptions? And my, well, this is moving into some area where you're looking at people's preferences, which is not as easy as just a hard basic cost. But you need to do it if we want to do this prioritization, and if we don't want to like use our policy instruments to support either the onshore or the offshore level. So I think uh, Papa got a good work out of this, and uh, we enjoyed that. And that's also one of the outcomes of the sustainable energy student that uh, they can you see afterwards in this area. This is an illustration that also shows what we could do in the energy systems analysis line. That is combining like some basic costs about generating technologies with some more intangible economic costs. That is affecting what we really need if we want people to have this in their background. Thank you. And, uh... Before we die of thirst, is